Hey everybody, this is part two of the lecture on octanol water partition coefficient, and I'm Dr. Lisa. Uh, so we, this, this chapter seven is about partitioning between any organic solvent and water. But we're really going to focus on octanol as our organic solvent because, like I said, we're going to use octanol as our proxy for all of the natural organic matter in the world. And why? Well, first of all, environmental chemists are not the ones who dreamed up the KOW, the octanol water partition coefficient. Actually, that came from pharmaceuticals, uh, and it describes how drugs partition within your body. It's very, very important when you're understanding how long a certain medicine will stay in your body. Great example is vitamin E versus, versus vitamin C. Vitamin C has a low KOW value. It's very water soluble and therefore it leaves your body in your urine, right? So if you take a ton, you can take thousands of milligrams of vitamin C and it's not gonna hurt you at all because you just pee it all away. But vitamin E has a very high KOW value. It partitions into the lipids in your body. So if you take vitamin E, it stays in your body. And it is possible to take too much vitamin E and make yourself sick. So that's why you have to be you know, very careful and you have to understand how chemicals behave in the body. And the octanol water partition coefficient is a useful way of doing that. So environmental chemists jumped onto this bandwagon because the... Um, Pharmaceutical people were already using the KOW, so there's this huge database of KOW values that's already available. And um, so we use this as our measure of quantifying how hydrophobic a chemical is, the hydrophobic character. And if we back it out, we can actually use it to estimate aqueous solubility, so it's really useful there. And we can use it to predict the part partitioning of the compound into other nonpolar phases. And we've mentioned, again, not natural organic matter, all kinds of things in biota like cells, lipids, proteins, all of those things, uh, and also other solvents. So KOW is a really good place to start. Why octanol? Well, octanol, you know, is, is, uh, is eight carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it's got an OH group on the end, right? Because it's an alcohol. Here's my OH group. So there's a, a octanol. And uh, because, so it has this nonpolar tail over here, and it's got a polar head. So it's what we call amphiphilic. It's, it's both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, depending on which part of the molecule you look at. And because of that, a broad range of chemicals will partition enough into the, KO, into the octanol in order to have measurable KOW values. Also notice, of course, not only is it amphiphilic, but it has the ability to hydrogen bond, both accept and donate a hydrogen bond because of the OH group. So it's got a little bit of nonpolar character, but it's also got the ability to hydrogen bond and it has a little bit of polarity. Um, so that means that a broad array of chemicals will partition into the octanol and give you measurable KOW values. So here's an example. This is, again, from the older version of your textbook, kind of showing the ranges of KOW values you could expect. So these small C1 and C2 compounds, kind of a small range, the KOW on the lower side, around 10 to, you know, a thousand or a million, or a thousand or, a, um, yeah, a thousand. That's 10 to the third, right? I can do math. Um, okay, so <clears throat> on the lower end, and then here's your alkylated benzenes. The longer the alkyl chain gets, the bigger KOW gets over here. Same thing, chlorinated benzenes. If you only have one chlorine, you're over here. We add six chlorines, you get up to a KOW value, maybe around 10 to the sixth. PCBs, you get to these really big PCBs. Here's the decachlorobiphenyl. It's got a KOW value of about 10 to the eighth. So that's getting pretty hydrophobic now. Um, the phthalates, these phthalate esters have some polarity to them, these polar functional groups, and so they're a little bit shifted to the left. They have lower KOW values, but again, as these side chains get longer, the KOW values get higher. Uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, around, you know, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7-ish um, for PAHs. So a little bit less hydrophobic than PCBs, but still pretty hydrophobic. And then you have your straight chain alkanes, you know, that can run the gamut. Totally nonpolar, so they uh, have a relatively high KOW value for their size, right? I mean, they've, they've got only five carbons here, but still a KOW of around 10 to the fourth or so. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, it's useful to have some of these benchmarks in your head. You know, I, I kind of know that the high molecular weight PCBs are over here around 8, um, and that the highest PAHs are more like 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7. 
because it helps you to kind of benchmark how things are going to behave in the environment. And we'll talk about that more when we get to some of the, um, some of the homework and the, the practice problems about partitioning. So if we think about this octanol water system, when you mix water and octanol and you let them come to equilibrium, some water does actually uh, dissolve into the octanol. You get one water molecule for every four octanols and you get about eight octanols for every 100,000 water molecules. So the octanol is not terrifically soluble in the water, but the water is actually fairly soluble in the octanol. And so that's important to keep in mind that um, water saturated octanol is a little bit different from just octanol, right? Because it has some water in it, a little bit more polar. So at equilibrium, we know that the fugacity in both phases is equal. We could write the fugacity as the activity coefficient times the mole fraction concentration on either side, the octanol and the water. We could write the mole fraction concentration as molar concentration times molar volume. Uh, and then we could back out KOW here is just C over CW. And again, note that it has the ratio of the activity coefficients built into it here. So it's, it, again, this is all about how ideal the behavior of the chemical is in these two different phases. So if we uh, rewrite this equation, we can rewrite it in this form. And so we have the, the activity coefficient of the compound in water here minus the activity coefficient of the compound in octanol. And this becomes useful to us because if we think about it, we could assume that the activity coefficient in octanol is pretty close to one. It's pretty ideal behavior. And if that's true, then KOW is largely driven by the aqueous activity coefficient, right? The aqueous activity coefficient. So if we plot the solubility in water here, which is basically the same thing as plotting the negative of the activity coefficient, and we plot KOW versus that, we get these, these lines. Um, and sort of in between these two lines is where the activity coefficient in water, or excuse me, in octanol goes from one to maybe about 10. So still very low. And you can see the vast majority of the compounds are kind of falling right along that line or in between these two lines. Um, where again, it's the um, activity coefficient in water here that is really describing what's going on with KOW. And it's because of these types of relationships that we can use KOW to predict the solubility in water. Uh, and note also, of course, that this is subcooled liquid solubility. That's always important. Okay, so uh, because KOW is primarily determined by the aqueous solubility, the corrections for temperature and salt are going to be made by adjusting the aqueous solubility term. So that's, you know, remember in the previous uh, lecture, I said that you could get away with just using Sessionow constants to predict how KOW would change. Uh, and it is true that some of that salt dissolves in the octanol, but it's also true here that the KOW is really primarily determined what's, by what's going on on the aqueous side of the equation. So that's one of the reasons why we can get away uh, with using this approach, using the Sessionow constant. And it's also why we can use linear free energy relationships to predict KOW from solubility and vice versa. And actually, it's usually vice versa because it turns out KOW is fairly easy to measure, but solubility in water is surprisingly difficult. So we have equations of this form. Log KOW is equal to minus log C sat minus some, some intercept over here. We just call this whole thing the intercept. Uh, and so... Uh, we can start to develop these types of linear free energy relationships where log KOW is a linear function of the solubility in water. And again, the big L means here that it's the hypothetical liquid solubility. Uh, even if your compound is a solid or a gas at that temperature, we're going to use their hypothetical liquid solubility. That's the only way these types of linear free energy relationships work. And so you just have a coefficients here, a, 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 a slope term and an intercept here and that that could help you describe what's going on. So there's pages and pages of these. Um, there's a, a, a table of many of these values in your book. And so you can back out what, um, the, uh, what the aqueous solubility would be. And if you go into EpiWin, there's a module called Water Solubility KOW, which does exactly this kind of thing. So that's another good place to, to stop here. And in the next lecture, we will talk about the uh, measurement of KOW and how you do it.